Hammer loaders, bullet casters, welcome back to my bench. I am bringing you today a little bit of closure on a concept that we brought up and discussed on why a properly cut clean forcing cone might end up having some lead fouling problems to begin with. Now, if you've been following my series, if you've been following my work here, you saw where I did a great deal of work to not only just clean up a forcing cone that was a little bit on the rough side and causing some problems with, you know, after range cleanup sessions. Um, so I had also went through a little procedure to smooth it out. I also discussed the purpose of the forcing cone, why we need them, and maybe why we don't always need them, but they're a pretty good idea to have on your firearm, that's for sure. Now, what I want to talk to you about right now and kind of show you with this little diagram that I have made for you is why a forcing cone is going to cause or have lead fouling in the first place. Okay, now your mileage may vary. Not every gun is the same. Not every load is the same. There's so many combinations. However, we're generally going to see that Forcing cone leading does happen even in a lot of our best shooting guns when we're dealing with cast bullets. Okay, so the forcing cone itself, if we take a look right here, I've tried to do, you know, an exaggerated drawing of this funnel-shaped section of the front of the barrel that we refer to as the forcing cone. It just pretty much helps to guide this bullet in straight. And here, this straight section, we have the barrel. Now, if you've been following my series, we've discussed groove diameter measurements, taken bullet measurements. We've measured everything that we can possibly measure. So let's take this into account. I'm dealing with what looks like a pretty standard idea of what a 44 caliber revolver will typically look like. Maybe not all the time, but this is the idea. Generally, a .429 diameter uh, inside groove diameter is generally what we're looking for in a 44 barrel. Now, typically our throats are gonna be a little bit larger, and as you know, it's important that we fit the bullet to the throat. Go back and watch my videos on this if you haven't. So notice this bullet here has a diameter of 431 thousandths, if you can see it clearly. I'm going to bring you in for a little bit of a close-up, just to make sure that you can follow and track exactly what we're dealing with here. 431 thousandths bullet traveling through this funnel-shaped cone, entering... This barrel with a groove diameter of 429 thousandths of an inch. Let's do the quick math, folks. <laughs> Anybody got it yet? Yes. There is a two thousandths of an inch difference between these two uh, dimensions. So naturally what we're doing is we're swaging this bullet down as it enters the forcing cone. The smoother the forcing cone is, the friendlier this process will be to the bullet. The rougher the forcing cone is, if this surface is like a cheese grater, guess what? It's going to scrape all kinds of lead off of this bullet as it swages down to this groove diameter, which is two thousandths of an inch smaller than the bullet. And if it's, you know, nice and smooth, well, the smoother that forcing cone is, the less lead it is going to try to pull from the bullet, and it's going to be closer to a proper swaging down in size than it is kind of a squishing down to size, if that makes a difference. So I hope this helps. This is the first reason. I'm going to show you another reason 
that you can also have lead buildup in a properly cut forcing comb and a well-made revolver. Uh, and I'm going to show you another concept that has to do with something else that we talked about, uh, the barrel cylinder gap. So let's look at this other scenario here. Now I have depicted the bullet and I'll bring you back in for a little bit of a closer look. I have depicted this bullet actually engaging into the forcing cone now and it's actually kind of started that moment where it wages down into a smaller bullet. Uh, by about 2007 inch. Now remember, this is all a very exaggerated drawing. None of your tolerances should look just quite as goofy as these do. And I want to also show you here this section that I installed right here is kind of a rough representation of our cylinder. And this area right here is the chamber of the cylinder and the throat. So let's consider for a moment that we have struck the primer and now hot gases are moving and possibly spiking. We might be pretty much at or close to peak pressures, especially if we're using a fast burning powder because look at the placement of this bullet. It has encountered some resistance at this point, which should cause some spike and pressure back here. So. Let's watch this. We're going to simulate. This is gas. The red depicts gas. And what's happening? We are plunging this bullet. We're nice and we're sealed up in this area here. We're not getting gas ahead of the bullet because we got a good fit, but gas is torturing the back of this bullet. So what's happening? This is kind of a form of gas cutting. So what's happening here? Lead. It likes to carry a little bit of lead when it, when it does this. So does it stand to reason that we might actually be plating our forcing cones somewhat in a way that we don't really have a great method to avoid just by the simple act of having this barrel cylinder gap? Because look here, folks, this is the gap that we discussed. And this gap accommodates an effect that we call gas venting. So whenever it vents gas, it's going to carry gas out this way. You know, again, I talked about before how there are some tolerances that we need to mind in this area, but they're all a little bit on the different side, depending on who the manufacturer is. And what's important to us is that we just don't have a problem in that area. If we do, that's when we need to start taking measurements and, and considering. But yes, gas is going to flow out the sides this barrel cylinder gap, it's going to strip some lead off the base of this bullet. We just can't simply expect the base of this lead bullet to not be affected by these hot gases. And so it stands to reason that some plating of lead might begin to build up in this area as the hot gases start to carry some of these little, little particulates of lead out. Now, all this stuff happened so fast, <laughs> what I'm looking at here is a theory in my mind of how this works. And it also stands to reason that the size of this barrel cylinder gap might actually help determine how much of that gas cutting occurs. So like I said before in a fairly recent video that I have heard of barrel cylinder gap contributing to lead fouling, in my mind, this is how that most likely works because the more open this space is here, the longer the dwell time of gas venting will occur and eventually this bullet is going to get further up and this is going to totally be a non-issue. Uh, so, folks, there is going to be some lead fouling that occurs. And most, the vast majority of it, 
can be avoided and most of that can be avoided simply by following a lot of the uh, uh, concepts that I put out there in this series. So let us not get too worked up. The point at which we have a problem is whenever lead builds up. What if lead builds up? so badly that we're like this maybe this is a combination of a seriously rough comb maybe it's not even cut centered uh, who knows but look you know, we we could possibly end up bridge this gap with lead and guess what this cylinder is not going to rotate it's going to lock up and if it's getting that bad over here you know, guys, we might also be building up some pretty nasty pressures. And then we might end up having this little phenomenon happen called. Ah, the glare. Boom. Let me bring you in. Yes. <laughs> For lack of better words. Now, most of us aren't going to have this kind of issue, folks, but again, this is why we need to make sure we're paying attention to what our, our gun likes, how it responds to our loads, and be mindful of our cast bullet usage and learn as much about our firearm as we can. Now, that being said, I have used this unloaded GP100 for the vast majority of the work that I've done in this series. And I feel like it's time to do a little review of this wonderful little gun. So friends, like and subscribe because I'm gonna bring you my thoughts and impressions on the Ruger GP100 and 44 Special here in my next video.